blood steel. To me, the most interesting thing about great game design as a concept is that it weaves deeply inculcated cultural modalities together with personal philosophical underpinnings and uses this intellectual framework as a kind of skeleton upon which systems and intricate mechanical creativity can be crafted, creating a holistic second world into which the player can escape. Be it a single developer or a team of hundreds, games are effectively windows into the minds and souls of other human beings. This is the true essence of the art form. Even in a simple game, Pac-Man for instance, the designers handcrafted a world of simulated life governed by defined parameters and rule sets with its own logic and anchored to the floor by the hopes and aspirations of those who created it. This is why I will continually and inevitably return to my fundamental comparison that novels and games share a lot more in terms of goals and design than either shares with a medium like film or TV. Movies, for instance, are a series of snapshots in time, wherein the world building is generally passively included in the total visualization of the script, while TV shows are generally serialized and formatted to meet a rough approximation of that same goal, but spread out over a larger period of time, to tell a larger narrative with more arcs. But with games, you don't passively take in the world. The escapist aspects of movies and television lack a fundamental core structure that define gameplay. A tactical sense of the world. It's also why novelizations and written continuations of games tend to be far more successful than the overwhelming majority of attempts to translate games into movies and TV shows. So much of a game's information is transmitted specifically through the player input. Over time, these goals and base sets of mechanics form into archetypes, the foundation upon which genres are created, and every genre has multiple levels of fans, ranging from casual interest to abject rabid defenders of the faith. Over time, as the popularity of genres rise and fall, Innovations and derivations and outright abandonment will ensue, particularly within the AAA market. Unfortunately, with our present economic system, large publishers tend to greenlight games for one purpose and one purpose only. The almighty dollar. There seems to be something of a cyclical effect going on here. As interest within a fan base wanes, so does the desire of a publisher to greenlight a game, which makes sense. But even if a game would end up turning some level of profit, companies are generally motivated to chase the largest possible profit margins, meaning that entire subgenres of games and beloved franchises will inevitably lose their time in the spotlight, fading off into the bitter chill of the night, living on in their purest form only in the minds and hearts of the fans and creators who love them. Over time, resentment over this gap in the market accumulates, and the genre of starvation begins to consume and radicalize entire segments of gamers. But sometimes, something miraculous happens. As time passes, a champion will occasionally appear, summoned into the limelight through the hopes and wishes of a passionate fanbase. And what had initially faded into bitter obscurity, reduced to merely a memory by the evil corporate overlords at, specifically Konami in this case, will return again. After 10 long years, now like 11 because I don't always get into new games in a timely enough manner to capitalize on their popularity, classical Egovania in its purest form is finally back and not a shred of a second too late. Welcome to Castlevania, Symphony of the uh, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, and boy am I excited to dig into this one. All the trappings of the Japanese game design that I love so much just flows out of every corner of this game. So let's address the elephant in the room. Fuck Konami. Initially I was a bit put off by Bloodstained, I'll admit, as I was part of the group that didn't exactly like the original art style, but unlike most of the internet, the improved art style didn't initially impress me much either. I mean, maybe I'm finally starting to descend into the bitter digestive system that is my advancing age in the face of a gaming landscape that is swiftly outpacing my heavily retro sensibilities, but I've always had an appreciation for pixel art. When the name Castlevania is mentioned in my presence, I simultaneously remember my first experiences with both the original game and the franchise on the NES, and the time I rented Symphony of the Night on the PlayStation. The day was dark, and rather cold and rainy. I can still vividly recall the sounds of heavy southern raindrops making splatter sounds against the window in my family's living room, only enhancing the atmosphere of a damn near perfect game. I mean, just look at this pixel work. The depth of color and texture allotted by the pixelated art is nothing short of breathtaking, even after all these years. Now granted, I'm using blue stacks to play the mobile release, but Jesus fucking Christ, just look at it. Now juxtapose that with this and... I don't know. The 2.5D thing just carries less personality than a great pixel aesthetic for me. 
That isn't to say that it isn't a beautiful art style, because in many ways it is. The mixture of lighting and shadows across beautifully constructed architecture strikes a provocative presence in its own right. Transitioning into new areas is legitimately interesting as the artwork provides each area with its own unique identity. Nearly all of the weapons are unique in appearance and many bring along several special effects and little bits of flavor that give them legitimate personality. And there are a metric fuckload of them, ranging from classic whips to heavy great axes apparently wielded by orcs or something, to guns. Some of the enemies are kinda doofy, but you'll be mowing through those in no time. When an enemy really matters, it strikes its own unique character amidst the horde of them. And on my initial playthrough, I found myself in a souls s sense of equanimity, wherein I automatically assumed that I might get caught off guard and calmly accepted death as a necessary evil. This is largely due to the aesthetic these enemies carry, many of them being large and threatening, and even if ultimately in vision alone. The bosses are where the art style really shines though, which will come as no surprise to anyone. There are several bestial monsters, one of which is actually sort of an incandescent hand that moves around like a spider, but the real gems are all of the anime boys and girls you'll encounter along the way. And the costuming on these characters is superb. My favorite boss in this game is the Bloodless, a vampiric, umbrella-brandishing seductress in a red dress that the player finds bathing in blood behind a curtain. She also beat the brakes off my lily white ass and forced me to learn her patterns, which is a hallmark of a great boss fight in my opinion. Still, in as much as the art direction grew on me as the time went on, I still can't help but wonder what this game could have looked like with some highly skilled and well-budgeted pixel art. There's something that's glossy and slick about nearly everything in this game. Even the sandy or rockier areas seem to have very little friction to their aesthetic. I mean, it's not really a misstep, but it is the largest complaint I have about this game, which is to say that it's not much of a complaint at all when all things are considered. It's good, I just think it could be far better. Outside of that though, there's much to be celebrated in Bloodstained, and if you caught the enormous amount of hype and praise upon its release, it's not hard to understand why. I said this game was a wash in classical Japanese game design in a minute. The customization options to fine tune your specifically preferred playstyles feels infinite, and there are a ton of systems at work that allow the player to make things as tight as they want underneath the hood. Do you like collecting a metric fuckload of items and combining them into new gear? Well get ready to push the limits of your ADHD riddled attention span to its limit. At base stat levels, the game is generous with its drops and the amount of gear you can craft is in patently insane. Rewards for exploration will yield new recipe books for consumables and weapons, armor, and accessories. And each carries with it its own strengths and weaknesses. And I'm dead fucking serious about this. Let's run the numbers for a moment here. There are 10 weapon types, each type having their own playstyle. Some weapons will only attack vertically, others will only attack horizontally. Some have a much faster draw speed at the cost of base attack power, while others have longer swings that hit significantly harder. There are five different elemental types, and each has both attack benefits and defensive benefits. Are you having trouble with an enemy that is fire-based? Switch to some fire-resistant gear and an ice-themed weapon. All of these are traditional RPG, especially JRPG fare, sure, but the intersection of all of these individual variables makes for some incredibly variable gameplay. If you wanted to, mind. You could feasibly just upgrade elementally neutral weapons and compensate based on pure skill. But that's kind of the beauty and fairness of a game like this. You can play it essentially however you want at the cost of maybe some time and effort farming items to get that really special piece of gear. Now the way that I bookended that section may have given the impression that this is the end of the customizability options, but you'd be sadly mistaken. Now I get to talk about the incredible magic system in Bloodstain, the Demon Shard system. In the base game, which means that you don't have to have the Ega backpack, there are 125 unique shards divided between five different categories. With the DLC, you get 126. This allows for the most insane amount of gameplay variability that I've seen in a game that isn't some kind of in-depth simulation. Your shards run the gamut, from augmenting your ability to traverse the map, to equipping you with specific resistances and stat boosts, to the most fun and interesting, befitting you with an absurd amount of spells and methods of attack. In my own game, I haven't even come close to trying out each of these, and I've logged about 34 hours on thus far, in case you were wondering why this review was taking so long. I probably said plenty and could end it there, but just to entice the min-maxers, each shard itself is highly upgradable, both by collecting multiples of the same shard and by alchemically enhancing them, increasing the ability of the shard and sometimes augmenting its appearance. Now to some, this may seem excessive, but where something like Skyrim grants player autonomy through a massive open world, Bloodstain sets a series of defined goals and gives you an incredible variety of methods of approach. I'm on my first New Game Plus playthrough on a higher difficulty for this fact alone, and my loadout is entirely different from my first playthrough, save for maybe a few accessories that I haven't quite been able to replace with what I actually want yet, but even that doesn't cover it enough. Bloodstain is a game with a wealth of after-campaign content. 
Not only is there a New Game Plus mode upon completion of the true ending, but there are a plethora of different modes and ways to play. There's a speedrun mode, which restarts you from a blank save and tracks your time. We have a randomizer mode, where you can customize 8 different parameters and create complete chaos across the map. Look, I'm getting toad shards and drops from these squid guys. There's a boss revenge mode, wherein you can choose from a pool of bosses and get revenge on the hunters. This mode doesn't really appeal to me too much, so I didn't dig too deep into it, but it's there if you're interested. The most recent update is the classic mode, a full bore 8 level classic Castlevania style mode, complete with all the familiar trappings of the first game, including the fucking knockback. And if that isn't enough, you can also play as a second character with a completely different playstyle once you've obtained the best ending, meaning that there's easily hundreds if not thousands of hours of interesting content for a $40 price tag. And all this brings me to my favorite and most immersive binding element of any great game, the element that smooths over the surface of a game, filling in the cracks and cementing all of the individual parts into a work of art that facilitates a true sense of immersion, the music. Veteran Castlevania composer Michiru Yamane makes a triumphant return in Bloodstained and really solidifies the game's feel as the true successor to Symphony of the Night that Konami refuses to bankroll in this modern era. Pulling from her classical and rock-inspired roots that made her a success in the industry for over 30 years, Yamane summons the essence and atmosphere of each section of the map and channels it to full effect, transporting the imagination of the player into the trials and tribulations Miriam is facing. Take Biblioteca Ex Machina, for example. You're treated to this theme when you first find Odin in his library. This song has an air of prestige about it, but there's also an underlying theme of foreboding. Interesting, considering that OD is simply a vampiric keeper of a library in a demonic castle, right? Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is a legitimate tour de force in a genre that is rife with amazing iterations and innovations spread wide throughout the independent scene. It is Koji Igarashi's vision in its most indulgent sense, but not to its detriment. The gameplay mechanics and fundamentals play out like well-written poetry, as though Bloodstained were written under a pseudonym, but so many of his strengths feel unhindered in the team's desire to achieve his vision. If you are on the fence and waiting for a push, consider this video exactly that. It strikes a delicate balance between casual appeal and satiating the hardcore, so that green newcomers and seasoned vests of the genre will be appeased. Igarashi and his team deserve every bit of that $40 price tag. Now as for Igarashi, this interests me as to where he'll take the genre next, because while Bloodstained is good, it does feel as though it's meant to be something of an entry-level game to the genre. If the genesis of Igavania from Symphony of the Night to the later handheld titles is any indicator, I think Iga's imagination will be taking us into exciting new directions.